Well, good morning, church. Woo, it is loud. Good morning. Glad you guys are here. Thanks for being with us online this morning. If you guys are in the back, grab your cup of coffee, come on in. And uh, this morning, I, I know that the rain has probably kept some out, but not you guys. You guys are here, and so I appreciate that. Um, at, if at some point the power goes out this morning, because it's flirted with it a couple times, we'll just keep on going. Just remain calm. Um, just remain calm. I told the, the, the worship team they're not allowed to say, every man for themselves. You know, you can't do that. I think the, the emergency lights will come back on, and we'll just do our best. We'll just do our best. And so at some point this morning, I think if I heard Brian Dar correctly this morning, he said there's some folks in the back. Um, he's like, but if you want, he'll give a dollar to every person who moves up at least six pews today. So, um, and so did you say that? Did I hear that correctly? Okay, all right. That's good because I made it up just now. But uh, at some point, we would love to have some of you guys maybe move up a little bit, especially if the, the power and the sound goes out. We'll need you to do that, but we'll just, uh, we'll just make it work. And so this morning, we're glad to be together, and we have the opportunity to worship together. Um, and people historically have worshiped when it rains and when it storms and all those things, so we'll have opportunity to do that. Um, I, I know that some of you maybe aren't the most technological, but you could, I bet you can do this. At some point this morning, if you grab your cell phone, go to your, your camera on your cell phone and just aim it at the QR code in front of you, a way to check in is just to aim it at the left one, the left one, the get connected part, and it'll ask you three questions, and one of them is your first and last name, just basically a way of letting us know you're here. Uh, if you've been, if this is your church home and you're here all the time, go ahead and do that anyway. But especially if you're visiting or, or you just haven't been able to kind of check in with us for a while, go ahead and do that. Again, the far one on the left. And if you just want to, again, if you get bored during the sermon and you want to play with the other two, you can figure out what they do as well. One will help you learn how you can give digitally, and the other can give you some good help on how to take some next steps in the church and in your faith. So uh, this morning we're going we're gonna to pray and we're going to sing. And if we sing real loud, we won't even hear the thunder. That's okay. Um, but let's pray together and then let's worship. Father, this morning, we are grateful. We're grateful for who you are. Um, there's that song, Awesome God, that says there's thunder in your footsteps and lightning in your fists. Our God is an awesome God. And uh, we are reminded of how small we are and how great you are. And so thank you for rain. We thank you for sunshine when it comes. We thank you for a new day of life. And right now, we thank you for the opportunity, whether in person or online, we thank you for the chance that you've gathered this group of people together. And I pray that we would hear from you clearly, that we would speak to you with our, with our prayers and our praise, and that we would honor you with our lives. And be with us this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Church, let's stand and worship together.
song we're going to do, um, I got kind of curious this week as to what the story was about the song, so I did a little digging, and, and I found it kind of interesting. I thought I'd share it with you guys. Um, this song is called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, and the person that wrote it um, found out she was going blind, and then her husband left her. So she was alone and losing her sight, and she read this quote from a missionary that kind of changed her life. And it says, so then turn your eyes upon him, look full into his face, and you'll find that the things of earth will acquire a strange new dimness. Her sight was failing her, but her eyes were focused on Jesus, and let's turn our eyes on Jesus this morning. Thank you. 
please join us in this congressional prayer, please. Our God, God help, help us love everything, everything that hinders, hinders us and the sin that so easily gets hold on us. us. Let, Let us, us run, run with, with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Remind us how he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at your right hand. Help us to think of him, of how he endured such opposition from sinners, in order that we will not grow weary and lose heart. Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, in whose name we bring this prayer. Amen. You can have a seat. In 1863, the Civil War was raging. A small town in Pennsylvania decided to formally open a military cemetery. Uh, they invited one of the leading orators of the day. His name was Edward Everett. Uh, he was to give a formal speech. They invited him to speak on October 23rd. He declined. Asking for more time for such a speech would easily run one or two and a half hours. I'm glad that Chris doesn't do that. And the city fathers would definitely want their money's worth. November 19th was selected as the day. One author at that time wrote, an oration was an oration in those days and had to have a certain style. It had to have classical allusions, a leisurely approach to the subject matter, a carefully phrased recital to the background, and history to the occasion. And the whole thing worked up to a glorious conclusion. Everett began with Pericles in ancient Greece. He slowly wound his way through Ezekiel's valley of dry bones onto modern times. And the applause at the end of his long speech indicated that it was well received. The city fathers had received their money's worth. Edward Everett was indeed the master orator as advertised. And sitting down, Everett handed matters back to the master of ceremonies, who announced that the President of the United States had a few words as well. In the thin form of Abraham Lincoln, walked to the podium, spread out two sheets of paper, and began four score and seven years ago. The only reason anyone remembers anything at all about Everett's speech that day is because of the remarks by Lincoln. His remarks turned a cemetery dedication at Gettysburg into history. You know, it strikes me that our worship is sometimes like that. We spend time singing, uh, some time preaching, and somewhere in the service there be, seems to be some kind of ceremony that sometimes seems like an afterthought. A visitor might assume it was trivial importance. After all, wasn't the most of the time spent preaching and singing? Yet Christians know that of all of our worship activities, the most indispensable, the most central is the Lord's Supper. Like those at Gettysburg that November who forgot Edward Everett's noble speech we must never forget, or we may forget the preaching, we may forget the words to the song, which I oftentimes do, but we must never forget what Jesus did for us. Communion is not an afterthought. It is at the center of our worship, and it commemorates Jesus' sacrifice for us. In Matthew 26, 26 through 29, we read, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body.
And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. As Lincoln's Gettysburg Address needed no great length, communion takes no great span of time either. In it, God speaks to our hearts, encouraging us to repentance, to remembrance, and an overwhelming hope. Church, we just need to remember to listen. Like you, I was born destined for death because of sin. Sin is anything that goes against God, who is perfectly just and good. We've all sinned, and the result is separation from God. That is true death. God desires restoration. He sent Jesus, who is both God and man, perfect in every way. Being perfect, Jesus died for my sins, paying the debt I couldn't pay, repairing the separation between me and God. By his death, I am made clean. I am a new creation. The unbearable weight of my sin is gone, and I can begin a new life free from sin and true death. This is only the beginning. Because of who Jesus is and what he's done for me, I choose to follow him. My outward self is washed as a display of my inward faith. I eagerly give him my obedience, declaring this gift to the world. God refuses to leave me scarred by sin. His desire is for me to have the humility, kindness, and love of Jesus. To fight the temptation, pride, and laziness of my old self. Knowing this world is still broken, I cling to the hope that is coming. When I am with God, finally home. And this hope I have in a future with Jesus brings me great joy. This is what God has done. I deserve death. Jesus died in my place. I am made clean. In obedience, I follow him. I grow in faith, and my future hope brings new life. This is amazing grace. This is the gospel. Amen to that. Last week, we started the series really asking and answering the questions, why do we do what we do as a church family? Why do we do the things we do here at Catlin and maybe in the larger uh, Christian uh, community? Why do we do what we do? And, and it's an important question because as I've seen, the church functions a lot like a family. And family, as we talked about last week, can be a little odd. My family can be odd, yours can be odd, and the church family can at least appear to be odd, maybe to those from the outside looking in. Which actually this week something happened that made me feel a little bit better about my family, maybe about yours. Uh, what, we're about, what we're about to see in a second is not making fun as much as it just reminds me that no matter what our titles are in life, uh, we as parents, we're, man, we're playing from the same playbook. If you guys heard this past week, um, the Queen of England, 70 years as queen, kind of a big deal. So they had the parades and all of that, but <clears throat> excuse me, when you're royalty is there going to be times where people are watching you? And I don't know if you guys caught um, the queen's great-grandson having a moment. And his mommy, the princess, having to be not princess, but mom. Check this out.
I don't make fun. I don't point fingers. As parents, we've all been there. It actually brought me great joy to say we're all on the same playing field when it comes to family. We have our good moments and our bad. And those moments, unfortunately for most of us parents, millions of people haven't seen our worst moments maybe. But hats off to her. I think she handled it pretty, pretty well. But last week we spent time asking the question, why do we go to church? Why is that something we do? Why do we gather this week? Why do we gather last week? Why are we going to do it again next week? Why do we do that? But today what we're going to try to, to do is ask and answer this question is what's up with baptism? Why do we get baptized? Why is that something that our church does? Why do I, why do you, why do people get baptized? And, and a couple of years ago, several years ago now, uh, somebody drew this picture, this caricature of me, but, uh, um, but kind of asking the same questions. Why do we give? Why do we go to church? Why do we take communion? Why do we get baptized? Some of the questions that we ask, and sometimes that is us, it's like, why? Why, why do we do these things? Why why get baptized? Is it a secret ritual? Is it an outdated tradition? What I want to do today is ask that question and do my best to answer it from Scripture. Some of you in this room, many of you in this room probably have already been baptized. Some of you watching online probably have as well. There's still probably stuff we can learn. Maybe there's some people in here who you're like, hey, I, I want to be a Christian, and I've heard that's a part of the process, but it's not something I've done yet. It's not, it's not a, a line you've crossed yet. Maybe this will be helpful to you. Or maybe you just have some questions, and today can again be helpful. But first, maybe ask the question before, why is what? What is baptism? And, and I'm not going to do a long, detailed Greek study, but it is interesting. The Greek word for baptize is a very complicated word. You probably won't even be able to say it. It's baptizo. <laughs> Not that complicated, is it? Baptizo is it's just a transliterated word. We just take the word from Greek, baptizo, and we get the word baptism. And it literally means to take something and immerse it in something else. Oftentimes we think of water. The idea of taking something and not, not dipping it, not, not sprinkling, but rather immersing into water. If you think about it like a pool, some of you in this room, when you go to a pool, you are a, you're a toad dipper. Right? Some of you, maybe this is you, uh, you go to a pool and you're testing the water. How many of you would say you are a toe dipper when it goes to the pool? You want to know how it's going to go and all that. And then some of you, there's only two options, really. I guess there's a, a third. But, but either you're going to be the toe dipper or you're going to be the cannonballer from the deep end. And so some of you are the cannonballer, right? This is you. How many of you are more the cannonball type, right? So just make sure you get in, you do it, you go in the deep end, and you just get completely covered in a way the word baptizo the word baptized really is much more cannonball than it is dipping the toe in the side of the pool this idea of being immersed and so in scripture uh, in the new testament when we see baptisms what we see is someone being immersed completely underwater then brought back up that's an important part representing a new relationship with jesus much like a wedding. A wedding, there, there's not a baptism, but, it, but in a wedding, before the ceremony, this couple, they're dating. They're boyfriend and girlfriend. They're engaged. But after the ceremony, they're married. Something happens. They've gone all in in that moment. They've said, I, I am immersing myself in this relationship. And that's very much what baptism represents. And so we see it is an immersion in water. But again, to the world, it might still look a little goofy. Or even in the church, we're like, okay, I'll do it because they tell me I should. But, but why do we do it? Why do we get baptized? And over the last years of, your, of our lives, the last months, and even the last several weeks, we have seen people be baptized. We just have a couple of uh, screens. You can go back and forth if you want to. I just asked this week if people would be willing to share uh, uh, pictures of their baptism. And I got a handful of those. And, and um, uh, the bottom right one on that one, I appreciate. That's my little Emma, you know, and, and the day that she gave her life to Christ. But as you go and look at those, maybe you can be, you be reminded of, of the day you were baptized. How many of you can remember the day you were baptized? You don't have to say the date, but you remember. Okay, very cool, very cool. How many of you would say you were older than 12 when you were baptized? Oh, wow, wow, that's really interesting, very interesting, very cool. 
And so a lot of us can, can look and relate or we can remember back to our baptisms, but sometimes we can still look at those and think, why did we do it? What's that all about? Sometimes we think we have some misunderstandings. Sometimes people think, well, baptism is about church membership, is, is I get baptized so that I can be a member of that church. And, and I can see uh, kind of the misunderstanding there and won't go down that road too much, but, but let me tell you, that's false. At this church in particular, we, in, we would say, yes, we want someone to be baptized before they become a member, but you're not being baptized to become a member of Catlin Church of Christ. That's what baptism is. But sometimes we think, well, if I want to be a part of a country club, I, I pay my dues. If I want to be part of a, of a cult or something like that, I have to have the, the odd rituals and the secret handshakes. I would not encourage that. Or maybe you want to be a, a part of a sorority. You have to pledge to be part of a sorority or whatever it is. You think to be part of this thing, this is the thing I do. But we don't get baptized to become a member of a church. But sometimes we think, well, we get baptized when we're old enough. It's just something you do kind of when you finally get old enough. I was a children's minister slash youth minister in my first ministry. And I was teaching children's church that day. And I remember the little kid, won't say his name. But after children's church, he was little, pretty young, uh, probably, you know, five, six years old. And afterwards, I, I knew him, but afterwards, his dad met me. And I had never seen his dad before. I didn't know who he was. Uh, I think it was one of those where he, he was with one parent one weekend and one parent the other weekend. But I met the dad, nice enough guy. He says, hey, I want to talk to you about baptism. I'm like, oh, you, you want to be baptized? You might want to talk to our senior minister. He's like, no, no, I want to, I want to talk about getting my boy baptized. And he's talking about this little kid. And, and, and children says, oh, has he been asking questions? Well, no. Has he been talking about baptism? No. Has he seen someone be baptized? Not that I can think of. I said, oh, I'm confused. He goes, you don't need to be confused. I just figured the boy's old enough now. Got to get him baptized. We had a lot more conversations after that and, 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 uh, and did not at that time baptize him. But the father was thinking he's old enough now. He, this is something we need to get him to do. And here's one that you won't find in the Bible. But sometimes we think of baptism as fire insurance. Well, let you think about that for a second. And as you think about that, I'll bring your mind to Monopoly, the game Monopoly. Right? <laughs> and so <clears throat> Monopoly, you know, you have the card that says get out of jail free. And if you land on go to jail, you're like, no, 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 no. I've got the card that says I don't have to go. And sometimes I think people see baptism as that, as, as I don't need a relationship with Jesus. I don't need to change my life. I don't need to follow him. I just simply need to get baptized, and now I'm fireproof. And, and I'm good. And so at my death, I can play that card while I was baptized. Baptism is good. I call it essential. But it's not for church membership. It's not something that we do simply when we get old enough or something to do just to avoid hell. Baptism in the Bible is far more beautiful than any of these. And I want to give you a definition that may be inadequate. It may be. It's the best I could come up with. And, and I made the, the letters too small, so you'll just have to hear me. You can take a picture if you want. But here's the definition, then we'll walk it through. We'll walk it through. Is baptism, in my assessment, is our trusting and obedient response to the invitation of Jesus. Baptism is our trusting and obedient response to the invitation of Jesus in which we accept his payment for our sins, embrace his lordship over our lives, and proclaim to the world our lifelong faith or our lifelong commitment to him. And just read it one more time for those who like to jot these things down. Baptism is our trusting and obedient response to the invitation of Jesus in which we accept his payment for our sins, embrace his lordship over our lives, and proclaim to the world our lifelong faith and our lifelong commitment to him. And so the first thing as we kind of walk that out is I want us to hear is that baptism, when we choose to be baptized, what we are doing, if we're doing it correctly, if we're doing it biblically, is accepting, it's our acceptance of his invitation. It's our acceptance of the invitation he makes to us for us to be part of his family. First Peter chapter 3 uh, Peter is writing this letter, we'll call it an epistle, and in the passage just above where we're going to read, Peter's talking about Noah and the great flood that really happened way back in Genesis. And he's talking about how eight people, out of all the people on the planet, only eight people were saved. They were saved in the ark through the waters. And here's what Peter says. 
is he brings that connection to baptism. He says, and that water, the flood water, is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but I love this, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you listen to that, what Peter is saying is that, that the invitation of Jesus is to you and to us and for you and for us. The invitation is there. His payment on the cross is there, but we have to accept it. There needs to be a moment in which we go from not believing to believing, not accepting to accepting. As you've probably been able to ascertain, the Lawlers are kind of passing a germ back and forth with each other. Emma brought it home last week. She's been sick and getting better. Thursday into Friday, I started feeling junky, um, and so just kind of ugh, whatever. Um, and so yesterday, I did what you should do when you don't feel well. I took a nap. <laughs> I woke up from my nap, and I checked my phone, and there were lots of messages, one of them from Emily, a very nice text that said, Hey, I met Danville Gardens, one of our favorite places on the planet. And she goes, you won't believe this. All their vegetables, half price for the end of the season. Half price. What do you want? I'll get it. Basically, translation, I'll buy. It's on me. I'll pick them up. I don't need any more vegetables, but I'm like, I'll get some. And so I'm like, hey. And I sent her this message back to which she replied, oh, I'm sorry. I've already left. And I looked at the time stamp. I responded like an hour later after she had already been there. The invitation she intended, the invitation was like, hey, I'll buy, I'll pay. But I needed to respond, and I didn't. Far more importantly, we see this principle in Scripture. Jesus says on the cross, I'll pay. I'll pay for your sins. I'll cover your life with my blood, all of your offenses. And he makes the invitation, but we have to accept it. We have to respond. And it says here in Scripture that one of the ways we respond is through baptism is by yielding to him in immersion, baptism. So it is our acceptance of his invitation. Second, baptism is accepting Jesus' salvation or payment of sin over our lives. Baptism is accepting Jesus' salvation or his payment over our lives. And you can turn to Acts chapter 2. We'll get there in just a second. But in Acts chapter 2, starting in about 37, we have the very first recorded sermon in the Bible. Peter has gone from fisherman to preacher man and is preaching now what is considered the first sermon of the church. And he must have knocked it out of the park. The Holy Spirit and it gave him power and he just absolutely rocked it. So at the end of his sermon, something happened to Peter that every preacher, which has happened every week, people, he got done preaching and people are like, we want it. How can we have it? We want to be saved. We don't want to be lost. We don't want to go to hell. We want heaven. How can we be saved? And there's just this mass of people asking Peter, how do we have it? How do we get that salvation for us? How do we get that forgiveness to apply to our lives? And here's what Peter says, starting in verse 37, Acts chapter 2, verse 37. He says, here's how you have it. Repent, that means change your mind and your way of living. Turn away from your old way. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and, all for, and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. To be saved from our sins is not something you or I could ever earn. We do not get baptized to earn God's forgiveness. We, we, it's not something that we work to do. something we accomplish on our own. It is a free gift. It's a free offer. But what we do see in this scripture is that when we recognize we are sinners is the moment that we look and say, I need to be forgiven of my sin. Is I have to understand and recognize that, that one of the hardest things about being saved is the moment where we are finally willing to admit that I have to be saved. To receive his salvation requires I admit my need for salvation and forgiveness of sin. And that's what we see Peter saying. It's acknowledging that, that we have to be saved from them. And that has always been unpopular. It has always been unpopular to, to call ourselves sinners. None of us like it. I, I don't enjoy that. I don't, I don't normally go out into public and introduce myself. Hey, by the way, Chris Lawler, sinner. 
I mean, I am, but that's not how I typically talk because we don't like to acknowledge that. We don't like to admit that. We never have, and it's even worse today. It's even worse today. One of the most intolerant things churches can say at times is that Jesus died for your sins. Elisa Childers, one of my very favorite apologists, teachers, if you've never heard of her, then I have failed. Uh, her book, Another Gospel, you need to read it. It might be one of the most important books outside the Bible that I've ever, ever read. She has a podcast. I encourage you to hear it. It's accessible. People, I mean, she speaks to people like me, so I know you could understand it. But I love how she puts it. She says, Jesus is unapologetically intolerant of sin. Pause. Jesus is unapologetically intolerant of sin. <laughs> Yours and mine. Whether we like it or not, he is intolerant. He has no room for it. But, <laughs> but here's the good news. But he is all-inclusive in his offer of salvation for those who repent and put their faith in him basically saying, y'all got it, and I can't stand it, but I offer to save all who will come and get it. And so when we are baptized, it's not something we're earning, but it is a way of saying, Jesus, I can't earn it, but I will receive it, and in submission I am baptized, knowing that my sins are covered. The payment of Jesus is applied to my sins. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Will you admit your sin and accept his payment for your sins? Next, is baptism is accepting his lordship over our lives. It's one thing to admit I'm a sinner and I need a savior. It's even harder at times to admit and acknowledge that Jesus is my Lord. Because I don't like being told what to do. How, how many of you do? How many of you get a thrill out of being told what to do? Most of us don't. Most of us are stubborn. Most of us have that streak. Most of us uh, bridle a little bit. Our backs go straight and we set our jaws. And don't you tell me what to do with my life. But that's exactly what Jesus calls us. He says, yes, you are a sinner and I save you. Will you embrace it? Will you accept it? But when we accept Jesus, when we come to him and are baptized into him, we are making a statement not only that we are sinners being saved, but that he is the Lord and we are the servants. He is the potter, we're the clay. And that's what we see is so important. We often want to be masters of our own destiny. But listen to what Jesus says, Luke chapter 6, verse 46, really powerful. He's not talking about baptism specifically here, but listen to what he says. Luke 6, 46, he says to people who call him Lord, would-be Christians, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And the implication there is, Following him means following him, doing as he says, yielding in baptism, yes, but also that he calls the shots for the rest of our lives. Yes, we're imperfect, but that when we surrender to him and submit to him in baptism, when we are immersed into that water, we are making a statement that he, that we come out of that water with a brand new Lord and Master, Jesus. <laughs> baptism is a statement of acknowledging to the world that we have gone all in with Jesus. When I get baptized and when you get baptized, it is a statement, and the scripture tells us this, it is a statement to the world that we've gone all in. I've probably shared this story before, but, but when I was in college, when I was at Lincoln, uh, I remember uh, one guy, he was on campus, nice enough guy, he'd been there for a semester or two or whatever, and so we were a little surprised because most, not all, but most people who go to Bible college are already Christians when they go. Not all. But this guy had gone. I don't know all of his backstory or whatever. But he had been on campus long enough. Had heard enough sermons. Been in enough classes where he'd heard this teaching. That he's like, oh my gosh. I need this. I need to accept Jesus as my savior. And so he decided to become a Christian while a, while a student at Lincoln. It was pretty awesome. And so he had all these, these papers made up. And had them plastered all over campus. Not a big campus. So it didn't take too long but probably a hundred places, and just, and I don't remember his name, but let's just say Jeremy. You know, Jeremy, whatever, being baptized Thursday night after chapel, or whatever, you know, after whatever, uh, I want everybody to be there, and it was everywhere, and it was really cool, and the whole campus was talking about it. I was going through the, the lunch line there for lunch one day, and, and all, they were plastered there, and, 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 and the guy came behind me, another guy just on campus, and, and he goes, I'm struggling with all those, those baptism things. I go, what do you mean? I thought he was kidding. I go, what do you mean? He goes, I don't like this. I don't like how, how, how much he's parading it. 
And I'm like, I don't understand. I don't, I'm not getting what you're saying. He goes, I don't think it's appropriate for these, these flyers to be everywhere. He says, baptism, in my opinion, is meant to be a private thing. Faith is meant to be a private thing. And someone much wiser than me later replied to him this. I want you to hear this. Listen, our faith in Jesus is personal, but it's never meant to be private. And most of the time, maybe not every time, but virtually every time in Scripture, in the New Testament, when we see someone baptized, they are baptized in some sort of, sort of public way. There are, there are a few where we look and maybe there are only two or three gathered. Potentially, we don't know for sure. But in almost all the cases we see, there is a public aspect to giving one's life to Jesus. It is a public, yes, our faith is personal, but it's not private. Just as it would be very weird to say, I want to get married to you, but I don't want to tell anybody. Can we get married to just keep it on the down? I mean, I love you, but I don't really want everybody looking at me. Can we, can we just keep this to ourselves? That is probably a marriage that's going to have some struggles. But instead, we typically invite a whole bunch of people and say, this is a big deal. Baptism is similar in that way. Romans chapter 6, listen to this. The Apostle Paul, listen to what he talks about when he talks about baptism. He says, don't you know, Romans 6, 3 and 4. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And if you listen to what Paul is saying, is this is a public declaration to the world, is that when we go in the water, we're saying we're dying. We are dying to our old selves we are giving up our old way of living, our old life. It's a public declaration. Y'all knew me. You knew who I was before Jesus. But that guy or that gal is dying. You're not going to see him or her anymore. And then we go into the water, it says, and we are buried. And, and typically, except with Jesus and Lazarus and us on the last days, when people are dead and buried, they stay there. Right? All the dead stuff stays in the tomb, in the ground, in the casket. And I think that's the image we see in Scripture, in baptism, this idea that our old sins and our old ways and our old shame and our old guilt dies publicly saying, hey, yeah, you might have known the person who did this and that and the other, but it's now in the tomb. Did a baptism. Actually, I don't think I did the baptism, but there was a baptism a couple of years ago here. And the gal, the young lady who was baptized, got a bracelet beforehand. And she wanted me to see it before she got baptized. And it says, I left it in the water. Remember that? And I love that her statement basically saying, I know who I was. In the world, to the world, I may look the same from the face, but I'm leaving my sin in the water. Love that. And then we're raised to life. When we come out of the water, there is this sense that I am a new creation born. Jesus said in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, he says, unless you're born of, sp of, of the water and of the spirit, born again. You can't be part of the kingdom. We have to, we go in, we're, we're buried. And then just as Jesus was raised on the third day, we are raised to life in baptism, to a new life here and a new eternal life after this life. And so all of those things are statements about the goodness, the greatness, the love of our Savior. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm not saying a private baptism doesn't count. But I do think that there's a sense of why would we keep that kind of love secret. Let's, let's proclaim his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Amen. Baptism is all of those things. It is all of those things. But then we ask, what happens? And we kind of just hit it a little bit. But what happens when we're baptized? And we're definitely going to go quickly here. But we're going to go back to Acts chapter 2. A couple of things. So, so we respond. Jesus offers. He died on the cross, paid for our sins. He invites us into the family. We accept his, his, his um, invitation in part through baptism, hearing and believing and confessing and repenting <coughs> and being baptized. And being baptized. What happens then when we do that? Again, Acts chapter 2, listen. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. It doesn't mean like you know, anytime you get wet, you're not being baptized. This is specific. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and all who are far off, and all for whom the Lord our God will call. 
Three things, three things, and we'll fly. Three things, actually more than this, but three things I want you to know happen according to Scripture when we give our lives to Jesus Christ and submit to Him in baptism. First, our sins are forgiven. Our sins are forgiven. Excuse me. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Payment on the cross, but at our, at our baptism, when we yield to Jesus, he applies the blood, the payment of Jesus over our lives. It's been paid. Jesus' account is applied to our account. His payment is for us. Our sins are forgiven. Second, we enter the family. It's implied in Acts chapter 2, but it's very clear in Galatians chapter 3. It says, you are all, talking to the church, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus for, or because, all of you were baptized into Christ, having clothed yourselves with Christ. You're all sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus because you were baptized into Christ in faith. There seems to be a correlation moment That we go not only from being sinful to forgiven, but we go from being outside the family to going to being children of God. I think that's pretty cool. And it also says in Acts 2 that that is when we receive his Holy Spirit to enable, uh, that enables us to live this new life out. And I'm not saying that God can't give his Holy Spirit at different times. And I'm not going to argue with anybody and say, well, you know, was I a Christian two minutes before baptism or two minutes after? I'm just not going to argue that timeline. What I'm going to tell you is in Scripture is there seems to be something supernatural that happens physically. Yeah, we go into the water. We see that. But then there's also something that happens we can't see. Is that is when we become family members of God and he gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit who empowers us and indwells us to live out this new life. So why would we? Why would we not? He invites us. He's done all the work. We simply receive it as beautiful as a, as a wedding. It's beautiful in this baptism imagery of coming in, going all in with Jesus. Why would I not? I think sometimes we have questions. Sometimes we're just obstinate, stubborn people. And, and I'm just going to pray that God breaks through that for you. But I think sometimes we have questions, and I don't have time to go through all of them, but three. Three questions that I think a lot of people ask. What about if I was baptized or sprinkled as a baby? You're like, I, I've, been, I've been trying to live for Jesus my whole life, but um, I, I've, never been a bab- I've never been baptized like as an adult. I was just, I was a baby. I don't remember it, but mom and dad went to a church and they sprinkled us or they dunked us. I don't know if babies are dunked. I don't think so. But, but you know, baby baptism. And, I, and first, first hear me is I honor every parent. I may disagree with the theology there, but I, I honor every parent who's ever done that historically because what they, I think they've been saying is, I want my kids to know Jesus. And that maybe is in their tradition what they've done. And so although I would say there's a better or a different way, I honor that. And maybe some of you are in this room and you're like, that's my story. And so I'm not throwing shade at that at all. Hear hear me. But I would say this, that infants and babies cannot freely choose Jesus. Infants and babies cannot freely choose just about anything. And so as much as I honor the heart of mom and dad who chose that, I would say if that's you, online or in this space you're like i i, I was I sprinkled i was dunked or I was, I was baptized as a baby but or i was a, as a young person and i i didn't understand what i was doing i just i just did it i would say maybe for you now would be a time in your life to say i choose it now can't change what has been but i think maybe this would be the time in your life to say i choose it i choose it for all the reasons we've heard about today i choose to be baptized and immersed into jesus for myself Interesting story. George Washington was baptized twice. Uh, kind of interesting. I read the story this week. Is that before we bring it up, um, he uh, he was sprinkled when he was a baby. Uh, that's what his parents did, um, and that's how kind of they did it from the, I think the Church of England and all of those things. He was baptized as a baby, but then later in his life, he did the worst thing possible. He started reading the scriptures. And so as he read the scriptures, he came to an entirely different view, and he called the chaplain of the Continental Army. And here's what he said. I love this. I have been investigating the scripture, and I believe immersion to, the be, to be the baptism taught in the word of God. We'll go to the next one. And I demand it at your hands. 
I guess Washington can demand these things. I do not wish any parade made or the army called out, but simply a quiet demonstration of the ordinance and of obedience. And by records, there were fewer than 40 people at the baptism of George Washington. Because he read the scripture and he's like, it was great what my parents did for me. But now that I'm old enough to recognize, I need this. I choose this for me. What if I believed a long time, but I didn't know I should? So it's like, you're like, hey, I love Jesus. I read my Bible. I pray. I've never, ever really known that baptism was a part of the equation. No one ever really taught that. And so it's not like you, uh, you disregarded it or you, you said no to Jesus. It's just you didn't know. And to that, I would say something similar. Because I know a lot of people in, have been in this place. And my encouragement would be, it's a lot less important how you got here. And it's more important what you do now. And so maybe in your, maybe you grew up in a different tradition or you grew up in a different denomination or a different church or somehow you just missed it. I am not going to say that your faith to this point is invalid. That is not what I'm saying. But if you've missed it to this point, why not now respond in grace and in, in obedience? And what about rebaptism? This comes up a lot or at least pretty frequently as people ask, well, you know, I was baptized and I kind of knew what I was doing, but I've gone left to center or I've gone off the reservation and I, I just feel like I need to get rebaptized to kind of like get my life back on track. And although I don't think that dishonors Jesus, I don't think that is necessarily a sinful thing to do. I don't think it's a necessary thing to do. If you, um, if you were baptized and you knew what you were doing and you believed it and you meant it and you understood it to the best of your ability and, and you committed to Christ, but you've gone off the reservation for a while, the most important thing is to come back. It would be, again, almost like marriage. Some people have renewal of vows, nothing wrong with that, but, but let's say you're married and then you go through a rough spot. You don't get remarried, you recommit. <laughs> and I think that's what we see in scriptures. Not the need to be rebaptized, but a need to recommit our lives, and we definitely see that. And so, so what, we know what it is. It is immersion in obedience. We know why we do it for all the reasons we talk about. We know what happens. He forgives us. He brings us into the family. He gives us his Holy Spirit. Jesus modeled it. I mean, for crying out loud, Jesus himself, who didn't need to be baptized, was baptized in obedience to the Lord and as a, as a witness and a model for us. He calls us to do it. He invites us to do it, and he waits for us to do it. Sometimes when it comes to our baptism, we go kicking and screaming and dragging. Other times we just can't wait. I want you to check out this video of this young man who could not wait to be baptized. This morning, uh, we have accepted Christ as his Savior and as his Lord, and he will demonstrate his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, by willingly being baptized this morning. He's been waiting on this day a long time. <laughs> and so, Jordan, upon the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Go, Jordan. The first time I saw that video, I thought the preacher says, whoa, Jordan. He goes, go, Jordan. I love it. I love it. That kid got it. He's like, I'm going to do it. And he did. And so I love it. I love it. What if we were a little more Jordan? I know, I know that many of you in this room, you're hearing this message and you're like, Chris, you did your best, but I'm already there. I've already made this commitment. That's great. Maybe this could be an encouragement to give some information to other people. Maybe you're online, you're like, I can't physically come and be baptized today, but you're hearing this, and you're like, I want to track that down more. Or maybe you're in this space today, and maybe you're here for the first time, or you've been here for the hundredth time, but you're like, I missed it somehow, and I'm ready to do it. I don't go kicking and screaming, I want to be that guy, and let's just do it. Typically not something I'm, I do a lot, but if you today, right now, over these next two or three minutes, as we get ready to wrap up, the team can come on up. But over the next couple of minutes, if you just say, I want to do it right now, we'll go do it right now. I haven't checked, but I think there's water in there. Or if you just say, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to do it today, but what I am going to do today is, is finally make the step. I'm going to come, I'm going to talk, I'm going to reach out, and I'm going to start that process so that we can do it. And so if you want to make that a commitment today, we'll do it, we'll celebrate. Or if you at least want to start the, 
get through the morning and say, I've committed, I've told somebody, I told the preacher, I told the elders, whatever it was, and I, I've gone past the line and say, now I'm, I'm committed. And even if it happens tomorrow or next Sunday or whatever it is, we'll still celebrate that as well. We know why, we know what, and will we choose it? Will we choose it today? Uh, let's pray together and ask the Spirit to move. Father, this morning, uh, I just uh, let us be a whole church of Jordans who when you lead, we just like, let's, let's go, let's do it, whether it's a first-time commitment or whether it's for baptism. Even though we've been tracking with you, we love you, we know you, we believe we are forgiven, but, but we've just never taken that step. Would that be today? Maybe there's some today who are hearing this gospel message for the first time. I pray that they and we would respond where you lead, that we would stop holding off, stop holding back, but that we would be drawn to that video we saw at the very beginning, the colors of the gospel, that our sin was as black as could be. But the, the blood of Jesus red pays for our sins, washing us white as snow as we enter the waters of baptism represented in, in that blue. And then we would have the, the new life that comes from your Holy Spirit in us and the new hope that comes from knowing that no matter what happens, you are with us and we are with you. God, I pray that you would move and that we would respond wherever it is. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, before this morning is over, online or in person, would you respond as the Lord is leading? Let's sing this last song together. foundation our rock the only solid ground the nation rise and fall kingdoms are strong now shaken we trust forever in your name the name of Jesus oh, we trust the name of Jesus
Here we are, Chris.